You can open to Acts chapter 9 with me, and I'm going to give us a little bit of an introduction. The title of the sermon today is The Cost of Pentecost. The Cost of Pentecost. Uh, I, I borrowed the title from a 1963 article written by Reverend Leonard Ravenhill. Um, not the sermon he preached, though. That's an amazing one. But an article that he wrote. I like to read what uh, these men of God are saying because uh, they're speaking to times and situations present and prophetic in its in its utterance. And we're seeing many of these things today get even more intense in our culture and around the world, for that matter. But this morning is an appointed time. Would everybody agree with that? Yeah. Now it's an appointed time that many of us may not fully grasp for many years to come. And yet I firmly believe that the immediate implications and the impact is going to rattle our intellect and our conscience as the Holy Spirit convicts us in His mercy and grace. On Thursday night, we went through Jeremiah chapter number 12. And Jeremiah is overwhelming me. And sitting under Pastor Jake's teaching is its one of the best gifts I've ever been given in my whole life. Okay, I don't have to log on to YouTube. I just get to go sit with Pastor Jake. The Lord has given him quite the mind. He gets that from his mama. <laughs> Well, so he got it from somewhere because he's broken. The mighty man of God, Clayton, is the same way. So we're, I'm listening to Pastor Jake. Jake. I tried to merge us together there. I'm listening to Pastor Jake teach. And so many things are affecting him. You know how cool it is to ride down the road with a man got to play a part in the latter part of his life and discipleship to help him stand where God was calling him and get to thank him for the way he's feeding you. That's special. Yeah. But he taught me a lot on Thursday night about what it means to walk knowing that the Lord is a true Redeemer beyond what we could think of or, of or imagine. Remember how we talked, me and Adrian used ourselves as an example, though it upset us a little bit. But our ability to forgive is, is often measured by the severity of the crime. You know, like, if, if Pastor stole a CD player out of my car, I could forgive him. You know, if he walked up and punched my wife in the nose, it would be a more difficult situation. Okay? But that's because I'm fleshly. He would never do that, but I just, just caught his eye and used him as an example. Okay? I, my flesh would measure those two things out and then say, no problem, it's a CD player, come on. I would have bought you one of you to ask. You harmed my wife? Big difference. And, and I would measure out my ability to forgive based on the measure of the crime committed. Jeremiah chapter 12, God speaks a word that says, these nations that taught my people how to worship other gods, I'll forgive them. I will bring them in to my family and name them among my people. Amen. And they taught my people to worship Baal, but I'll forgive them if they repent. Yeah. Now, love that is just as well as he is merciful. Yeah. He says, if they don't, I'll uproot them and destroy them. But pretend we don't want to focus on that for this morning. Pretend we want to focus on the fact that he is a very merciful God. And that the nations that taught his firstborn son Israel to worship Baal, he would say, if they repent and call upon me, I'll name them among my people. Jeremiah 12 is profound at unlocking for us the depths of God's mercy and his love and his ability to offer forgiveness even when you don't feel like you're worthy. Yeah. If you don't feel like you're worthy of forgiveness, stop making that excuse and run in the freedom that the blood of Jesus came to give us. Amen. That blessed me. 
Thursday night that blessed me tremendously. I'm grateful for the blood of Jesus. And He takes the most wretched and depraved men and He makes us saints of the living God. Amen. That's pretty special. Amen. So last Sunday was very special. And most of the people in this tent made a short 32-minute drive and stood on top of a parking garage. And the testimonies from that are still surfacing. And we gazed up 10 stories at the most beautiful site that you could ever see. And an entire family demonstrates commitment to fight. Yeah. Not a single family, an entire family. Like a massive group of people. We're fighting together, okay? We will win together, and we will fight together. And no brother or sister or their children will ever feel like they're alone. We're committed to fighting for this. We are seeing victory. So Pastor Zach picked up the guitar, and he took us into a classic. It's a classic in our church. It emerged from the dusty grounds of Zimbabwe, Africa, Clayton brought it home and he taught it to us. And now we sing it. And we sing it like wild men Amen. and women. And we sing it passionately. You are the God who reigns in me. Who was, who is, and who is to be. It's, a, it's becoming a battle cry for our church body. Amen. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. You are the God who lives in me. The one who was and is to be. I raise my hands. I sing to you. And rightfully so, this is a personal testimony, rightfully so, my eyes are fixated on a certain window on the 10th story. And yours were too, and that's where they should have been. And, a, and about a third of the way through that song, Zach is cutting into this portion. You are the God upon the throne. So let the earth break out in, what's that word? Joy. In joy. I wrote voice, but I have trouble with song lyrics. Let the earth break out in joy. And then I'm listening to this. As this family is singing, you ride the clouds in the sky and you clothe yourself with brilliant light. And the Lord told me, I know you all love her and your eyes upon her. You could never love her like I do. Fix your gaze up about four or five inches and look into the expanse of who I am. Amen. Look into the heavens. Look at the sky. Look at my glory. Yeah. You look there. Amen. And that's where you'll find the rest and comfort yeah. that you need Amen. because He is holy. And he is right. Amen. And He is true. Amen. And He is worthy. Yes. And I, I felt myself in that moment not wanting to leave my eye from the hospital room window. I didn't want to I didn't want to leave that perspective. And the Lord said, you have to. Because you're singing to me. And I am watching over this family. They are mine. And this brought me so much peace. Only because His holiness was on display as we gazed into the wonder of who He is. So less than eight hours later, all the mighty men roll up to that same hospital garage. Pastor Zach and Pastor Jake alternated camping out there with beautiful Mary Olive so that Clayton could come down and stand with those men. And then he picked up the guitar. Amen. And Zach's awesome. The way Clayton sings that song, we shook the hospital Amen. to watch a man of God declare Amen. holy, holy, Amen. holy is the Lord Almighty. Amen. Let the earth break out in joy. You ride the clouds up in the sky. This led me to this whole very agonizing week where I'm thinking about the cost of Pentecost. thinking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I'm thinking about how I don't want to succumb to modern day religious 
errors of manufacturing something. Because boy, if it was dependent upon a setting, the Holy Ghost would never show up here. We don't have a fog machine. We don't have flashing lights. We have a little bit of background music, but that's that's what they call a synthesizer, and that's not bad either. We don't have anything to evoke our emotions. I think the Lord has given us a gift in that because okay. He wants us to walk in the authentic power yeah. of God. Yeah. And that means you walk in the gifts of the Holy Spirit and you won't think it's about you or your anointing. You won't think it's some kind of special classification that you've reached. You'll know it's for the glory of God. And you'll know it's for the perfecting of the saints. And you'll know that it's found in the place of brokenness and loneliness. Not the place of excitement and floating glitter. It's not there. It's in the agony. It's in the distress. It's in that place where we're almost broken. And the Spirit of the living God descends upon us. There's a cost to Pentecost. There's a, there's a great price to pay yeah, yeah. to walk in the power of the Holy Ghost. Yeah, if we're going to see a true expression of the Holy Spirit moving through the people of God, you will have to be a reformer in your day. Yeah. Yeah. Pushing against the errors that have emerged without forsaking the necessity of walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to explain why this has surfaced so urgently within me. And it's because it's related to discipline. As I've been carving out entertainment, not, not fast entertainment, like I'm not uh, uh, hooked on uh, uh, fantasy football, not like that, okay? But entertainment, like you go to pray and I need some music in my ears. You ever felt like that? Like, I need to get near the Lord, I need to hear a song. It's tough. I'm going down the road. I need I need the radio on. I need a little. I need a little. For me, the Lord's been taking me to quiet places with my brothers, not in solitude, but these quiet places where the noise is going down because I'm starting to catch a glimpse of how loud His whisper actually is, and He wants to speak to us. And I'm learning that times of agony get me in that place. They get me there. Yep. You say, well, I don't want it to be that way, and I don't, I know you don't either. But when you start flipping through the pages, men and women of God that were immersed in the fullness of his spirit, and it was never about them, but yep. about the Lord. Yep. They had one thing in common. They were dying daily. They were dying daily. In Acts chapter 9, I'm going to go through some of these scriptures quick because, man, I just looked at my clock and it's only 11 o'clock. That feels, nah, I'm not going to let that sway. I promise. But y'all are right in front of the fan, so y'all are my fan club. Okay? Acts chapter 9. I Meaning you cheer me on. If I say a couple more scriptures, you're like, no, 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 keep going. That's the fan club. Acts chapter 9, you know the story. This is the conversion of Saul. I'm not going to read it all. I bet everybody in this room <clears throat> is very familiar with the conversion of Saul on the road to Damascus. We can pick up in verse 4 where it says he fell to the ground and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I'm Jesus, whom you're persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and it'll be told you what you should do. The men who traveled with him, they stood speechless. <laughs> they stood speechless, hearing a voice, but they saw no one. Anybody think that's supernatural, by the way? Yeah, I know you do. You don't have to answer back. I know yeah. you do. Saul got up off the ground. Uh, his eyes were open. He couldn't see a thing. And they led him by the hand. They brought him to Damascus. This is Saul of Tarsus. Yeah. He's, he's 
murdering Christians by the thousands. He's blind, he's being led by hand. And they brought him to Damascus. He was three days without sight, he didn't eat or drink. There's a disciple named Ananias. He gets called to go to him. How would you have liked to have been Ananias? Go to the street called Straight. <clears throat> Verse 12. Uh, he had seen in a vision, and a man named Ananias came in and laid his hands on him, so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, "Lord, I've heard many, uh, I've heard from many about this man, how much harm he did to your saints in Jerusalem. And there he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call upon your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, because he's the chosen instrument of mine. You wouldn't have picked Saul, but God did. He's a chosen." instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the sons of Israel. I'm going to show him how he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias departed he entered the house, laid his hands on him and he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus he who appeared to you on the road which you were coming, he sent me so that you could regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately fell from his eyes something like scales. He regained his sight. He got up. He was baptized. He took food. And he was strengthened. Does that sound like to you? Does that sound to you like a setting? That you would currently see advertised. To try to invite men and women of God to walk in the Holy Spirit. Wow. You'll never see that seminar advertised. You're going to see the great prophet such and such. Prophets never advertise themselves. They don't put their names on business cards. They're hated men. Okay? Supernatural healing event coming soon. I know supernatural healings happen at those, but I'm tired of it. It hasn't produced anything that outlasts the meeting. We need men and women of God to have encounters with the presence of God yes. that radically change them. Amen. I'm not preaching against the miraculous power of the Spirit. I'm preaching for Him. By His strength, yeah. He's letting me speak on His behalf. And there's an authenticity that we must return to if we're going to see Spirit-filled Christians make it through actual adversity. Yeah. Yeah. I want to consider the baptism of the Spirit this morning in light of circumstances. If we use the text of Acts chapter 9, Paul and his conversion. It's a Pentecost experience, right? Yes. But it was in the midst of pain. It was in the midst of discomfort. The God of the universe wants to forge something so deep within our souls that it withstands the test of time. This would mean it's a painful Pentecost. See, we coin it the second blessing in, in our charismatic circles. I don't, I don't have anything against that. I just want some further clarification. It's a painful Pentecost. It is a blessing, but you have to see it as painful. You have to see it as he must break you yeah. so that you can actually come to that place yeah. where you're willing to surrender all of who you are yeah. Yeah. to His Spirit. Yeah. Yeah. You say, well, that happened at my salvation. I do believe that. And I do believe that He wants to be filling us for the purpose of becoming more like Him. I'm not on a soapbox with this issue. I'm in the trenches with the Holy Ghost because I'm watching a lot of pain hit our body. A lot of pain. A lot of things we don't understand. And to shepherd it rightly, the pastors have to agonize first through it so that the body can be strong through it, that the families can be strong through it, and that our <clears throat> and that our love for oh thank you brother next time I preach here Oscar won't be here to bring me that glass of water 
but you can email it to me. Can we go to Acts 2 real quick? Oh yeah, I was saying. The Lord's teaching this to me and that's why we're administering it to the body. <clears throat> There's agonizing days <clears throat> and the Lord's doing something special within them. Amen. Very special. And I commend the faithfulness of the people in this room. I really felt like seeing it like that today. I commend the faithfulness of the people in this room. I commend the faithfulness of ministry in New Hampshire. I commend the faithfulness of a grandmother who's taking care of grandkids. One's getting ready to leave the country. One's in the hospital. That's a lot. That's a lot. I commend the faithfulness of the Vermilion family. Amen. They're hearing from God like brand new believers. I commend the faithfulness of Deborah Cossabo. She's fighting the good fight. Amen. She will win. I'm grateful for you. And the reason that we want to administer the word this way is because we're only subject to think that He's present within us when things are pleasant. We're going to be a very disappointed people. Because the joy of the Lord is our strength. It doesn't mean everything always is exactly like I want. But it does mean I have His strength. See in Acts 2 verse 1 it says, When the day of Pentecost had come, and that is a feast. Pentecost means fit. Older Testament, the Feast of Weeks. We've taught on that many times. You don't need me to break that down all over again. But this is a feast. When that day had come, everybody's gathered together in one place. Suddenly there comes from heaven the noise like a rushing of wind. And, this, and it fills the whole house where they're sitting. And there appeared to them tongues of fire distributing themselves and it rested on each one of them and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak with tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Church, a terrifying reality is emerging in the comfortable hour of plenty and peace in the church culture. The authenticity of the church's ability to walk in the fullness of the Spirit is negatively affected by two predominant errors. I'm going to tell you the errors, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about them. I have a couple other things I'd like to get to. The two predominant errors are that the Spirit of God doesn't move that way anymore or that a Pentecost setting is something that we can manufacture by entertainment. Wow. Addressing this in our body is because we're facing a lot of trials that are meant to strengthen us and equip us to burn with a greater fire. I'm going to be transparent and tell you, this is extremely hard for me. I don't want to be a man whose faithfulness is contingent upon circumstances. I don't want to be that man. But I have a lot of growing to do. I have a lot of growing to do. I want to be a man whose faithfulness is contingent upon what God's Word says and then it's settled. Because if I am a man whose faithfulness is contingent only upon the circumstances, my life will be like a shifting shadow. I won't be able to be like John the Immerser. Spoken of him was, what did you go out into the wilderness thinking you would see? This man eats locusts and honey. You're not going out there to find a reed shaking in the wind. We want to be oaks of righteousness. Amen. That's why this is a growing intensity in our body. Because the Lord is actually calling us up to a standard. And some of the circumstances, hey, 
you know, we don't care that this will be on YouTube later. We just call it like it is. Some of the circumstances, I hate them. I hate them. I don't like them one bit. I don't like seeing people hurt, struggle, pain. See, I don't like it. And in that moment, I have to be able to see what the Lord is trying to accomplish through it. My vantage point pales in comparison to some others in this room. But I will say this. I believe the Spirit of the Lord is giving us that spiritual growth spurt that we would not have had except we're facing some of the things that we're facing. Yahweh God is, is healing us. He's growing us. And it's beyond what we could think or imagine. And in these moments, we have to see the baptism, the immersion, whatever terminology you like the most, we have to see being immersed in the Holy Spirit. Yeah. To an even greater degree. Yep. Let's go to Second Chronicles chapter twenty. Remember, I said Pentecost means fifty, so that would mean it doesn't mean first. <laughs> okay. The Amazon culture has ruined us. Two days shipping, I wait for nothing. I don't even have to wait for the radio to play my favorite song. I get what I want when I want it. I don't think any of those things are wrong, but I also don't think they're assisting my ability to wait well. <laughs> but I'm glad for two days shipping because I got some stuff that should be here soon. I'll say this while you're flipping to Second Chronicles 20. Being filled with the Spirit is about being near Him and accomplishing His divine supernatural work. Amen. It was never supposed to be about you and some kind of strange validation of your anointing. No. It's the accomplishing of the work of God. It's the perfecting of the saints. Yeah. Yeah. A true Pentecostal experience is one that remains faithful to pursue all of who Jesus is. Singular moments of emotional rush, they fail us tremendously. We want to walk in the fullness of the power of the Spirit. And the Scriptures are clear in Corinthians. Can anybody finish this sentence for me? Pursue love and earnestly desire spiritual gifts. But we're often inclined to limit this. To a setting like if the right speaker and the right music and the right setting is there, then perhaps I will be given this. Saints, that's wrong. Wrong. You could be in the setting where there's the right speaker and the right music and the right time, because that's today. Yeah. But I'm saying no man can manufacture this. Well. These are broken men and women laying before the Lord, letting their flesh be carved away and the Spirit of God taking over all of who we are. This is a broken and desperate place. This is a painful Pentecost. And there will be witness to things. And this is where we're going with this. Something Kathleen and I were talking on for the last couple of days. I like it when she can write out my sermons. It makes me, I can stay up late watching the Brady Bunch. I'm teasing, that's a joke. You notice I switched from Friends to the Brady Bunch? Friends is corrupt. I like it when the fans are going because I can't hear your laughter so I'm not inclined to keep going with any kind of comical relief. Here's where I'm going with this. It's in 2 Chronicles 20, and, and we're going to work this to its point. <clears throat> Unless one has already been made, in which I'm thankful for that too. 
Second Chronicles 20 is where you hopefully have arrived. But I want to say something about the painful Pentecost or the cost of Pentecost. Because it's in that place that we witness things that make the nations stand in awe of who God is. And ultimately, that's the purpose behind our salvation, deliverance, and freedom to walk in them anyway. That the world may not. Yeah. Do you think the nations are being impacted because of a man-made image of what the power of God looks like? They're not. And they could never be. If man tries to manufacture this, the nations will never stand in awe of the majesty of God. Because man has done it, not God. How many missionaries have graced the land of this country? And I forget who said it. It could have been the, uh, his name slipped my mind, but I, I'm going to say Watchman Nee, but I can't remember. But he was telling a pastor once that the most profound thing about the churches here in America is what they're able to accomplish without the power of the Holy Spirit. As a young man in the church I grew up in, which I'm very grateful for, I loved when the, the missionaries would come in to hold week-long revival meetings. They were mighty men of God. They were Baptist in their denomination. And here's why I love them. They would stand on a stage under the scrutiny of leaders who they had to be cautious what they said around. And I can remember one looking me in the eye once. I don't know why he looked me in the eye, but it just caught my eye. But it was impactful enough to affect me. Affect me. And he said, there are things that I've done. There are ways that I've prayed. There are things that I've seen where I'm at because of the positions that I'm in that I can't even say here. And I don't know why it just settled upon me. The impact of that settled upon me because my mind began to wrestle with that and think, necessity is making these men walk in a way that I don't experience because there's not the necessity. I'm not, I'm not a broken man. I'm not watching my son die on a dirt floor and need to believe in the power of the resurrection. And the healing power of God to heal. I'm not there. But I will arrive there. Amen. I will yearn and I will press into your word. And I will get there. And then you begin to read. About authentic moves of God. That shook. The very nations. And made them take notice. In this account in 2 Chronicles. In chapter number 20. And then we're going to go to a close. Is everybody okay? Yeah. Thank you for letting us share this morning just from our heart. Amen. The church is battling well, and I'm very proud of you. This is a time where we're going to grow in our vigor and strength in our walk with the Lord. Second Chronicles 20. Judah's getting ready to be invaded. Anybody heard of a man named Jehoshaphat? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I know you have. Yeah. I know you've read this text. Hey, one that stands out to me is verse number 13. It always snags me pretty hard. I guess it's because, I don't know, look around the church. But Judah was standing before the Lord with infants, wives, and children. I love the distinction between infants and children there. 
think about standing before the Lord. But Jehoshaphat, in fear, he turns to the Lord. The Spirit comes upon a, a servant named Jehaziel who says, Don't be afraid. The Lord is with you. Is that rhetoric to anyone in the room? No. The Lord is with you. It can become like that to me sometimes. Like imagine you're going somewhere alone and you're a little nervous. And when you get there, you realize Adrian's there. And then you hear, hey, don't don't worry about it. Adrian said, just in a fleshly, from a fleshly perspective, that's very encouraging. Yeah. 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 Wait, Adrian said, oh, I'll be right there. Imagine the Lord is with you. Yeah. And so let's go to verse number 14. Let's go to verse 26, actually. I don't want to read too much. Take too much time, but... Verse 20. It's what we did this morning. It's what the Lord is asking us to put in place. They rose early in the morning and they went out to the wilderness of Tekoa. And when they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and he said, Listen to me, O Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Put your trust in the Lord your God and you will be established. Put your trust in his prophets and succeed. And when he had consulted with the people and he appointed those who sang to the Lord and those who praised him in holy attire and they went out in front of the army. Why? To give thanks to the Lord because his loving kindness is everlasting. And when they began singing and praising, the Lord set ambushes against the sons of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who had come against Judah and they were routed. Can I ask you a very simple question? Where is the miracle there? Where is the miracle? And if you're like me, you would say when the Lord sent these ambushes and then all these mighty armies are routed like the Lord fights our battles for us. As I'm interacting with that throughout the week, I'm thinking about it from a little different perspective because the Word of God allows us to see the Scriptures in its authority and its accurate representation, but some days from an angle of this, some days from this angle, still the same Word, it just affects you different depending on what you're walking through. And the Lord calls me to see that perhaps the greatest miracle is when the man's heart gets in position to send worshipers first into battle. Yeah. Giving God victory. Yeah. I'm sorry, giving God praise even before the victory was to be had. Yeah. I feel like that's a miracle. Yeah. Why is that a miracle? Because a man's heart is at this place of surrender that's right. that allows the power of God to then be on display. Yeah. That's, right. that's the miracle. Yeah. That's a good word. Here's the first time I saw an immediate healing I did not even believe God would do it. I got out of a car with a young man, and we were just trying to go eat at a buffet. I have since stopped eating at buffets, but back in the day, I could do so. Now it's it's like a nap or a possible ER visit. Okay. And we got out of the car, and this man just hits the ground. I have no idea what was going on. He just hit the ground. 
and he's laying there and he's holding his leg or his left side. And I look at the young man I'm with and I'm thinking, I really just would like to go eat, but this is, <laughs> I think we're supposed to pray. So they, they keep the food warm in there, you know, they keep lights on it. They keep it warm. It's fresh at all times. And we drop to our knees and begin, we just begin to pray. But the man stood right up. And he just looked at us and goes, what did y'all just do? And we kindly said, we have no idea. Uh, no idea. We just actually wanted to pray for him. The whole time we ate in the store, all he did was just stare at, stare over at us. There was no line, there was no cameras. There was two men who probably felt pretty ill-equipped. One, because don't we all struggle with insecurities too? We're mainly thinking about eating, so it's not on the agenda. But we just lowered ourselves to a position of prayer, and the Lord did it. And He got the glory. And He looked wonderful. And He looked mighty. The man was instantly healed. We went on about the day. There's no Facebook posts. There's no Insta chat feeds. There's just one to your food. The presence of God wants to reduce us in these times so that He can look good. He started to think the greatest miracles when Jehoshaphat settled in his heart that he could be secure in the word of the Lord. And then a man's heart was positioned rightly. And there you have the cost of a true Pentecost. Rightly positioned hearts. Verse 22, they began singing and praising the army was routed. Go down to verse 25. Jehoshaphat and his people came, took their spoil, and found much among them, including goods, garments, and valuables. It goes on to say, as you read along, in verse 29, the dread of God was upon all the kingdoms of the lands when they had heard that the Lord had fought against the enemies of of Israel. The cost is always worth it because God is the one who winds up looking majestic, Amen. not you. Amen. Kind of reminds you of Rahab a little bit. They're approaching and she's like, everyone's terrified. We've heard that Yahweh God of Israel works on behalf of His people. We've heard this. We're terrified. That's the true power of God. Amen. Now He needs you. He works through vessels to accomplish this work. So expect Him to do things that are supernatural. Amen. Expect it to be beyond what you can fundamentally or theologically explain. And it's okay. Can I read three quick things and we're going to close with John 9? Yeah. If you want to look up that article to read it, it's called The uh, the Cost of Pentecost by Leonard Ravenhill, 1963. He says three things that you must consider as the price of walking in the Spirit. The first one is the price of reproach. People will express disapproval. Brothers and sisters, when you start walking in the Spirit, critics emerge. And you may have to be acquainted with the fact that if the world didn't get along with the holiest man who ever lived, he can't get along with me. There's a price of reproach. There's also a price of disruption. 
I'm not reading this whole article. I'm giving you the three things. There's the price of disruption. That the Holy Spirit disrupts your plans. You ever sat in the service, even in this very tent, where we prayed, Lord, come and do what you want? And if he did, we'd actually be terrified and maybe try to stop it. We will do things in order because we are called to do so according to the scriptures. But we also can't contain someone like God of the universe. I mean, he breathes the galaxies. If he wants to storm into this tent, and just radically wash right over us, guess what? I can just stand right back out of the way. There's the price of disruption. And lastly, there's the price of waiting. The price of waiting. We need this waiting to get clear in our minds that the Holy Ghost visitation, it would not have fit into our preconceived theological orbit. I liked reading this just because it's a little bit of an intellectual piece. We need waiting. I need waiting for humiliation. I need waiting for time of confession. I need waiting for my spiritual eyes to be refocused on the holiness of God and the depravity of man. When we thank church that we're interested in winning the nations, we have to think that that has to be beyond mere lip service. How do you win the nations? Is it by writing the best songs? Is it by sending the most missionaries? All those things play a part, but the way the nations will be won is when they see the power of God on display in your life and mine. Yeah. And there is a cost to that. Amen. Because to see Him come through demands agony. Yeah. It demands tough situations. Why do you think why do you think they're afraid of the approaching army of Israel? They've heard about a God who could make a sea open up and let all his people walk right through and then close it right back up in time to see the reproaches of Egypt washed away. They're starting to hear that. Well, it's time for a true expression of the church of Jesus Christ to arise Amen. where we walk in the power of the Holy Spirit understanding there's a cost and a price that we're willing to pay. We're going to prepare ourselves to go to John chapter 9 and as we do so I need uh, Elder Michael Parker and Elder Chris Spence to come stand Pastor Zach and Pastor Jake to come stand and we'll have Pastor Oscar stand right in the center <clears throat> and then you guys flip to John chapter 9 and we're going to get prepared to bring our service to a uh, to an authoritative close. This is a special day the way the Lord aligns things. We have an elder in from South Carolina. <clears throat>